Jenna, I have some bad news. My father, your grandfather, William Moore, has uh, passed away. Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's okay, Jenna. None of us are near his house, and we need you to go and make sure the house is okay. There should be a key on the front steps. Okay, I'm on my way now. Hmm, locked, locked. Grandpa always had a sense of style. I wonder what this opens. My dear friend William, it has been too long since last I... Dear William, I know this day is always hard for you, and I hope you know... What does this do? Hmm, locked. Locked. A painting of Grandma, or another woman. Grandpa never talked about her. More old newspapers. Else. Come to These think are of really it, old and well my parents preserved. never did Ooh, either. Another set of numbers. I never did beat Grandpa chess. He bet me that I couldn't beat him until I was 18. I could never do it. It was like he was several moves ahead at mm. all times. It looks like something goes here. Mm. Locked. Something is inside. How does one take a castle? There's a lot of old military paintings here. I don't remember them being here when I was a kid. Grandpa never smoked. He must have had a visitor. can take a castle. This is locked. This is locked. This is locked. Grandpa always did like the classics. I wonder what no press up press means. That's a lot of old newspapers. They might be worth a lot of money. This room doesn't look orderly. It's as if Grandpa was frantically looking Dear for William, something. I must confess something that I wish I told you years ago, but... Is this a painting of the Crimean War? Dear William, I will never not be grateful for all that you've done for me. The light bulb is missing. I wonder what up, press, down means. What is this? Dear A William, letter? I can't believe civilization works with all... opens a light bulb I wonder where it goes another key 
It says kitchen on it. Hmm. Locked. This is locked. Looks like the house was modernized. Still feels really old though. Something is inside. Dear William, I always wondered why you didn't... finished talking to the guild in 1952, I thought... Something is inside. Another key on the table. This must be the key to the bathroom. Statues. I better find them all. Look, the box is unlocked. I bet this opens up the closet door. Something is inside. Something is inside. Something is inside. Another key. I wonder what this opens. Hmm. Looks like something is missing. This goes to one of the bedrooms upstairs. Something is inside. You have a great grandchild. Her name's Ellie, and she's healthy and beautiful. Something is inside. These are probably all collector's items. This house is old, mm, but I don't know how old. I think it was retrofitted with electricity after it was built. All classics. Picture of dad when he was young. This was his room. Do you really think? 
think Jenna has what it takes to fix the guild? The light bulb is missing. This opens the other bedroom. Dear William, I had a meeting with a few of the crows. They threatened to take the insurance. My aunt, always stylish. I bet this opens the master bedroom. Hmm. Looks like something is Grandpa missing. Grandpa always made his bed no matter what. Remember when the world seemed to be in a constant state of war? This looks interesting, but it needs a record on it.
Did I ever tell you I saw Mary in New York after we left Europe? Something is inside. This is a very old map in mint condition. It must be worth a fortune. Something is inside. Something is inside. Something is inside. This looks like the key to the attic. It seems I have to reassemble the machine. key goes for basement. strange to notice myself thinking things that this looks like it goes to the device outside
Looks like there's something in the basement. I bet this goes in the gramophone upstairs. What does it say? Dear Jonah, if you're reading this, then I'm already dead. I'm sorry I never said goodbye to you, but I knew you would try to convince me I was making the wrong decision. What you're going to read here will sound too strange to be true, but I swear to you, every word is entirely accurate. I've gone by many names in my time, but the name that is truly mine is William Moore. I was born in 1835, in Newcastle. It was an exciting time for the city. Buildings were being knocked down to make room for great, grey stone structures. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing, and the city and its production grew every year. I saw Queen Victoria when I was 14. She visited Newcastle to open the new railway station, and everyone came to see her. I never felt the hunger pangs of poverty, but we were by no means wealthy. My father was a dock worker at the port of time. The North was built on workers like him. In 1854, my life took a drastic change. A fire broke out across the city, burning down many of our friends and family's homes, and Britain was at war with Crimea. It was the first time war had ever been shown the way it truly was. Newspapers printed stories and even early photographs made their way to the UK. I felt the need to join, so after the fire, I offered my space in my house to my younger cousin and joined the army. It was here, I believe. The strange story of my life truly began. One day, I was on patrol and stumbled down a pit, and at the bottom I discovered a wounded Russian soldier. He had been shot in his abdomen and had already lost a lot of blood. Standard protocol meant I should have killed him as soon as I saw him, but he was no threat, and he was going to die anyway. Instead of killing him, I offered him my flask and helped him drink from it. He asked my name and told me he had a nephew also called William. I don't recall his name now, though. From his pocket, he pulled out a golden amulet. It was like a cross, but the top was curved over and it was adorned with strange hieroglyphics that glimmered in the light. He called it his ank, and pressed it firmly into my hand. He told me a story not entirely unlike the story I am now telling you. How he had lived for hundreds of years, and that the ank grants almost everlasting life. Of course, the rational part of me took it as the ramblings of a dying madman, but the second the ant touched my skin, I felt indescribably different, and I knew what he was saying was true. I asked about his injury and why the ant didn't prevent that. He explained that the power of the ant was limited. It could only slow down nature, not prevent death altogether. He also told me I must keep it on me, or at least near me, at all times for it to work.
He had a backpack with more gold in it than I could even imagine. He told me it was mine to keep, but that I had to meet the guild first, and that if I didn't, they would find me. He said I had no choice, so reluctantly, I agreed. His final words were words of warning. The guild is more powerful than you could possibly imagine, he said. If you cross them, they will kill you. As he died, I closed his eyes and wrapped a coat I found in his bag over his body. I walked south toward the coastline as he instructed. The boat was exactly where he said it would be. Rowing was difficult with the gold weighing the boat down, and the fog made it hard to see the island he described. But eventually, I found it, and I found the square stone he said would be on the island's west coast. The stone was even larger than he described, a monolith facing out toward the sea. The same hieroglyphic patterns that were on the strange relic in my hand also covered the stone. As he instructed, I then lit a fire in front of it. I waited about six hours before I saw the flicker of an oil lantern approaching from the sea. A small vessel eventually revealed itself through the fog. Three men came ashore, each with rifles drawn and aimed at me. I threw my arms up in surrender, but they didn't lower their guns. I repeated the passphrase the dying man told me, Pisces, Pisces, over and over again. Only then did they lower their weapons. They asked who I was, and I explained how I'd come to be here, and what had happened to the man. They shared a look with each other, before telling me to board the boat. That was the last thing any of them said to me for a journey that lasted days. We arrived on another island. I never did learn where. I was ushered through castle ruins into a room with the most marvelous decor. The room hosted the most impressive display of historical artifacts I, even to this day, have ever seen. There were Roman and Greek sculptures that would be the prized possession of any museum nowadays. Their condition kept immaculate and preserved through the ages. The walls were covered with paintings from many different cultures and art styles. A grand table laden with golden chalices and glistening silverware stretched the length of the room. Around the table were ten seats. One of the men I sailed with gestured toward one of them, then left. I waited half an hour before the door again opened. Nine robed men entered the room, each taking one of the remaining seats at the table. Servers entered and poured each one, as well as me, a drink, and shortly after food was brought in. Then attention shifted toward me and the interrogation began. I retold the story of how I got to be here. They were friendly but insistent, and if I didn't answer something to their satisfaction, they probed for further detail until I did. Some of the questions were not even related to the dying man, but were philosophical or moral questions. After two hours of deep interrogation, they seemed satisfied. The guild had lasted for millennia, they explained. The council, which I was sitting in front of, was the highest form of decision-making in the guild, and was comprised of its nine oldest members. 
Some members had even been on the council for over a thousand years. They then told me about the object I had in my pocket. They told me it granted almost everlasting life, and that this ank was now mine, and I should always keep it close to my heart. There's a button on the ank, they explained, which allows you to duplicate it once every ten years. This is how the guild grows. The ank is the most powerful item ever gifted to man, but its power, they warned, is alluring. To some, even all-consuming. Throughout the millennia of the guild's existence, the guild kept the ank secret, but they also kept it under control. Many people became corrupted by the ank. Its power corrupted thoughts, turning otherwise kind caring people into thoughtless selfish monsters, intent only on self-gain at the expense of everybody else. They had a name for people who were beyond saving from its influence. The Crows. They also told me about the rules. Most of them, understandably, had to do with avoiding attention. The secrecy of the guild and the power of the Ank was the most important thing, and the lengths they would go to maintain this secrecy were violent and excessive. If I wanted to get married and have children, I had to have my wife approved beforehand. They told me I had to change my name, that I could never go back home, and that I would never see my family again. The punishment for doing so, they said, was death. I left the island rich beyond my wildest dreams, but entirely alone. For the first time in my life, I had not one friend or family member I could talk to. I emigrated to New York and spent the next 20 years learning from the guild. I learned how to invest and how to stay anonymous. I met my lifelong friends, John Wesson and Willow Green, both members of the guild themselves. Though I did miss my family, life was good and peaceful. In 1878, I met Emma. I fell in love from the moment I saw her. She was smart and beautiful, but most importantly, she made me laugh. It was three years before I told her about the Ank, the guild, and how old I really was. She, of course, didn't believe me at first, but after meeting John and Willow, she came to realize I wasn't joking. She was so nervous when it came time to meet the guild. I always knew I wanted to marry her, but with the guild and the life consequences of joining, I took it slowly. She was given the task of delivering a case full of gold across the country. She was told the value of it and promised that it was entirely untraceable and that if she wanted, she could leave with it forever, and there would be no repercussions. There was a part of me that was frightened she would. She was inducted into the guild a week later. We bought this house together. New York had tired us both out, and after being inducted into the guild, Emma was needing a new identity and location to live. Life with Emma was perfect. She continued to make me laugh, and every day I was excited to discover something more about her. I felt like the luckiest man in the world, knowing that this dream I was living would last for hundreds, possibly even thousands of years. You probably wouldn't believe it, but this house was new once. 
The estate you see around you now, with its modern brick buildings, noisy children and cars in every driveway, was once a humble farm. When she told me she was pregnant, I was so excited to raise a child with her. We talked endlessly about what the child would be when they grew up, how they would put an end to war and poverty, how they would raise their own family and we would have a town full of grandchildren and great-grandchildren to watch over. She died during childbirth in 1895. Both the children survived. We were going to name them George and Joseph, but Emma liked Charles better than Joseph, so I named them George and Charles. It was hard raising two children on my own. Losing Emma took the excitement out of it. I found myself resenting them, even blaming them for what had happened to her. I hated them, but I hated myself more for feeling this way. It's not what Emma would have wanted. I neglected them and buried myself in work as a way of distracting myself from losing her. I think this is why they turned out the way they did. It was around this time John and I started the investment firm Moore & Wesson. We provided loans to up-and-coming entrepreneurs and were making money at a rate beyond anything I had ever imagined. At the outbreak of the First World War, John and I decided to enlist. The things that were happening across Europe, how could we do anything but join? The twins were old enough to live without me, so I sold my shares of the company, left them both with a small supply of money and gold, and hoped to never see them again. John had mastered the art of forging documents and created fresh identities to use after the war. The horrors of war quickly came back, but this was completely unlike the Crimean War. We spent months in trenches unable to advance. Constant bullets and explosions rained overhead. Your ears would constantly ring from the blasts and an uninterrupted night's sleep was unheard of. Many of the young men I shipped with died horrible deaths. I don't know why I, who by this point had lived a full life, and who at times wanted to die, survived. But life is strange like that. When the war was nearing its end, John and I faked our deaths and returned to America. I moved to Chicago and John moved to California. I was going by Joseph at this time. He seemed like a nice way to honor Emma. Moore and Wesson had become a national bank by this point. There were branches in most cities across the country. And would you believe it, there right at the front, above the counter in every branch, was a picture of John and I. People often commented that I looked just like William Moore, and I'd always reply that he's old enough to be my father. I was reading a newspaper sometime in the early 1920s, and I saw George and Charles there on the page looking back at me. I still remember the headline of the article. War heroes and sons of William Moore start their own bank. Their bank continued to grow throughout the 1920s, becoming one of the top banks in New York. Their names became household names, and I wouldn't even hazard a guess at the money they were making. But there was something else I noticed when I saw them in the paper. Something worrying. They looked exactly the same as the day I left them. Young men approaching their twenties, not adults aged by life and war. Many of 
instantly they had used the ink. I wrote to John asking if he knew about this, and he agreed to look into it for me. The guild had a way of knowing when an ink was duplicated, and it turned out that my ink had been duplicated in 1913. The guild made contact with them the same year, and they were inducted before the war started. to reach out to them. I was nervous, afraid they would hate me after running away. But knowing they had joined the guild meant they would at least understand. John and I flew to New York in February of 1929. We made an appointment to meet them at their huge office in Manhattan. The conversation was tense. They were upset that I kept the guild from them, but I ran away to maintain the secret. And even though I tried to explain the burden of being in the guild, and the real cost of the ank, they said it should have been up to them to decide if the cost was too high. That stripping them of that choice was selfish. Perhaps they were right. But I knew since they were young children, that the power of the ank would corrupt them. They were the sort of people the Ank feeds on. We spent the rest of the day eating and drinking. The best chefs in New York catered to our every need. We drank wines and champagnes that cost more than most people earned in a year, even a lifetime. George and Charles had chosen a life of opulence. They wore it well as if they had always been part of the elite. I asked how they knew about the Ankh. It turned out I hadn't been as good at keeping secrets as I thought. They discovered some of the correspondence I had over the years, and, of course, weren't entirely blind to the fact I hadn't aged. They found the Ankh one day while I was asleep and duplicated it. I should have done more to keep it secret, but how do you keep a secret like that from your own family? They had joined the guild together, and the guild gave them a second ank so they wouldn't have to wait five years to both be under its sway. I don't know how they passed the test. They must have lied through their teeth. After conversation moved on from the guild, they told us about their business how the loans they were creating were basically worthless. They were making money at the expense of the people using their services. They told us that something big was coming. John and I already knew that the guild were extremely powerful, but it wasn't until this conversation I realized just how powerful and pervasive they were. All of the top bankers in the country were guild members and a great many of them had already been corrupted by the Yank. The market, they said, was overvalued and crash was inevitable, but unpredictable. So they were taking measures into their own hands, and were going to crash the market in September. The sell-off had already started at a small scale, but by September the sell-off would be massive, the moguls had already started shorting their stocks, and while the rest of the country would plummet into an economic depression, wealthy guild members stood to make unprecedented amounts of money. The sell-off would present a unique opportunity to buy stocks in almost any industry at the lowest price they had been in decades. With the widespread adoption of cars, the ever-increasing demand for flight, and the film industry entering a period of boom, there were so many industries to take advantage of, and so much money to make. John and I were shocked. We implored them to reconsider and warned them of the effect that would have on ordinary people, but they wouldn't listen. We spent weeks devising ways to stop the ploy. Countless hours spent arguing with the guild begging them to do something. We weren't surprised to find out that it was the crows behind the plan. Nor were we surprised to find out the twins 
had joined the faction. We were, however, surprised to find out just how powerless the guild was to stop them. Realizing the crash was inevitable, John and I did all we could to mitigate the impact. The loan company we had started some 15 years earlier was now a national success with a huge number of employees. The owners were still the same ones we sold to back in 1917. I sent a package to them telling them the stock market will collapse imminently, that there was nothing they could do to stop it, but that they could limit the impact on the company by selling their investments and leaving the stock market. A few days later, I saw an article that Weston and Moore had sold some of their ventures. We called it a restructuring. And when the Wall Street crash came in September, Weston and Moore managed to remain open, keeping the majority of its employees in work across the country. It was a small victory, but at least we felt like we did something. During the height of the crash, the twins faked their death by jumping out of their office window. Suicide was commonplace for Wall Street investors in the period. Part of me wishes they really did jump. After what they did to the country and the rest of the world, they really deserved to carry on living. And not only living, but living a life of luxury. With more money than most people could even dream of having. I donated as much money as I could afford. Working within the guild, we set up soup kitchens across the country. Bread lines formed, sometimes for miles. They helped, and thanks to their work, many people who would have otherwise died from starvation survived. But it was still not enough. The global economic and political situation was dire, and most people knew that a war was coming. I spent the 30s traveling the world, Flying by aeroplane was magical and opened up so much of the world to me. When I joined the Crimean War all those years ago, I never thought I'd make it past 25. And yet in 1935, I celebrated my 100th birthday. The global economic and political situation was dire, and most people knew that a war was coming. I spent the 30s traveling the world, Flying by aeroplane was magical and opened up so much of the world to me. When I joined the Crimean War all those years ago, I never thought I'd make it past 25. And yet in 1935, I celebrated my 100th birthday. In 1936, I traveled to Germany for the Olympics. The event was grand. The Germans had built stadiums on a scale I'd never seen before. The event was televised across the world, and it looked immaculate. Despite how it looked, it felt completely different. The swastika hadn't yet become the symbol of hate we recognize it as today, but a rampant nationalism could be felt in the air. The German papers condemned attendance and the participation of black people and Jews. A hatred in the air, and Jesse Owens, a black American track runner, when his gold medal was palpable. I felt afraid for him in those moments, and knew the tension I felt would erupt into something much bigger. And in 1939, it did. When Pearl Harbor was bombed and America was forced into the war, I sold my house and contacted John letting him know of my intentions. It was the third war I had fought in, and seeing how much war had changed since Crimea terrified me. Young lads were being butchered. But war was no longer isolated to just the battlefield. It was felt at home. The news told me of the decimation in London and Coventry. My home country, which I always loved, was being destroyed. After the war was over, John and I moved to Seattle. 
I developed what we now call PTSD, but back then we called it shell shock. I couldn't sleep at night, and my days were filled with flashbacks. If I heard a loud noise in the street, like a car backfiring, I would duck for cover and walk in, flooding back. I drank a lot. It helped me forget, and sometimes I would even pass out and get some sleep. John helped me a lot too. He was always there to talk to me. He understood, even if he wasn't dealing with the same issues himself. Living forever became lonely, and I needed to share life with somebody else. So in 1952, I married Margaret. Margaret brought back a joy in my life I had not felt since I lost Emma. She was funny, kind, and ambitious. She lived every day like it was her last and wanted to leave nothing undone. She passed the guild's test without issue, and we were looking forward to spending a long life together. In 1952, I really felt like life was worth living again. I moved back to New York, into the house I had purchased so long ago. It felt like home, familiar in an unfamiliar time. I really appreciated what I had in those years, and I also appreciated all that I had seen, and what had changed in my long life. Technology had come so far. There was still the part of me that grew up with oil lanterns that thought of it all as magic. We had two children, your aunt, Rose, and your father, Frederick. I loved the both of them so much. I felt a connection with them I had never felt with the twins. Life was blessed until Margaret started to change. She started drinking more. She became detached and depressed. Medication didn't help. If anything, it made it worse. Made her numb to the good times, but still she absorbed all the bad. I knew it wasn't her. The ag was corrupting her. I did all I could. I spoke to everybody I could in the guild to find a way to fix her. To bring her back to herself. But nothing worked. guild took her away one evening. I fought against it, battling old friends as they came through the door, but they overpowered me. I never saw her again. Explaining to the children what had happened to their mother was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. I couldn't tell them the truth, but what could I say? told them she died. John and Willow helped fake her death and organized a funeral. I made my decision shortly after that. I couldn't let my children use the egg. It had destroyed Margaret, a woman full of life. It had ruined my relationship with my first two children, and it had caused a measurable amount of damage to the world. I made the difficult choice to not let them know about the guilt. Knowing they would grow up and one day die before I even appeared to age was hard and filled me with guilt. But I had no other option. In the 1970s, I started to feel hatred and sadness. It wasn't the same as I felt after the war, but instead deeper. Less visible, but I struggled to find any meaning in life. Over the next 30 years, it just got worse and worse. In the 
1990s, my grandchildren were born. I should have had many grandchildren by now, but these were the first that I was aware of. When I saw you, and your brother, I felt such love and adoration. But I couldn't feel how you were. It was a strange feeling, seeing these new faces that I loved more than anything, yet still having the pit in my chest grow. I feigned many smiles, but could never force to be one. I tried everything. Doctors, medication, even therapy. None of it worked. Eventually, sometime in late 2010, I decided that it was time to let go. It felt like I was completely shut off from humanity. I have lived a good, long life. I've seen the world, I've seen mankind at its best and at its worst, and I've seen technology advance the 